rent and offering. We don't have to pay to be out here, but we do have to pay for our building. So uh, we have the box here for those who want to give. Folks ask how they can give when they follow online. You can do it through uh, the website, NorCal Grace, or you can do it through the P.O. box, okay? If you pray for us and give, that's how you can give back if you desire. All right, Colossians chapter number one. We're going to, um, I was going to continue our look at 2 Corinthians, but since I know we're going to have some, some new folk who may not have uh, ever been to our assembly or, 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 or new to the assembly, I wanted to uh, focus on why we do what we do at NorCal Grace. And the main purpose is to conform us to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's God's purpose for each and every one of us, uh, because everything God does is in Christ. So today we're going to look on what it means to be in Christ Jesus. In Colossians chapter number one, look with me if you will, before we have a prayer. Um, we're going to start at verse 12. I'm going to read down and uh, we'll, we'll have a prayer giving thanks to the Lord. Speaking of, in verse 12, Paul says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who have delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things are created by him and for him. And he is above, before all things, and, he, and, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints to whom God would make known what is the richest of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Let's give the Lord thanks for his word. Our Heavenly Father, we do stop right now to give you thanks and praise. We thank you for your holy word, uh, your holy word made flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God who died for our sins and was buried and rose again that third day, according to your holy scriptures. We thank you for those holy scriptures, the word of God, Father, which we can come on this beautiful day you've provided in your beautiful creation here to, to hear your holy uh, word. And, and, and magnificent word, and we thank, we thank you for it, Father. Father, we thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ, those who are with us right now, those who aren't with us but are with us in spirit, those who are following by way of the Internet. Uh, we ask that our time of study this afternoon be uh, profitable, it, that it be edifying and builds us up in the faith in Christ Jesus. And for those who may not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, that they can come to a saving knowledge and understanding of, of, of your gospel of grace through Christ Jesus this morning, this afternoon. So, Father, as we look into your word, give us insight, understanding, and wisdom. But most importantly, Father, as always, a greater appreciation of your Son, the precious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his wonderful name we pray. Amen. Um, we talked about, when Larry sung that song, he was talking about the glory. And, and, and when we talk about the things of the, the, the Father, all the things that the Father focuses on is in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That glory that Larry sang 
was the glory that the Lord Jesus decided to share with those who would trust him today. And in order to receive that glory, as we're going to see at the end of the passage, Paul talks about, he says, it's in Christ Jesus. That's where the glory resides. And, and we who know that, 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 say, that salvation uh, uh, understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ, look what he says in verse 12. He says, giving thanks unto the Father. Everything starts by giving thanks to the Father. When I put on here, pray, I, the first thing I put is pray because we want to thank God. The fact that we can even talk to God is a gracious thing that he gives us in Christ Jesus. Because of what the Lord did for us, and we're going to see more about it, we have access by one spirit to the Father. And in verse 12, he says, giving thanks unto the Father. And what has he done for us? Which hath made us meet. That, that, that word meet means uh, fit or proper. He, he has made us meet or fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. God has an inheritance he wants to share with his children. And it's more than just heaven. Anyone who trusts the Lord Jesus Christ has a one-way ticket to heaven, no matter how they live their life. God wants us to live our lives pleasing to him, but because of what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished at Calvary, we receive an inheritance. We become heirs of God the, the moment we put our faith and trust in Christ. We have heaven as our inheritance, but there's more than just having heaven for our inheritance. We're going to learn that because of our walk, based upon our, our obedience to the Lord's word through the Apostle Paul, we can have more than just an inheritance. We can have a joint inheritance, equal share of reigning, ruling and reigning in his heavenly kingdom. And that's what he's talking about here. Notice in verse 12, Paul says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet or fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He's talking about those things which he has prepared in the heavenly places for us. In verse number 13, notice what the Father did. He says, who have delivered us from the power of darkness. We were under Satan's spiritual power, that dark power when we were lost. When you were not in Christ, we were part of the kingdom of Satan, that kingdom and power of darkness. But because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did in verse 13, it says about God, he has translated us. You know, we talk about translations and so forth. God is into translations, not just of the Holy Scriptures, but he translates the, 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 the one who puts their faith and in, in trust in Christ. God translated from the power of darkness, Satan's dark power, and he puts us or translates us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, when he uses that word son, I don't want you to miss it. When it comes to the scriptures, the issue of a son is more than just a relationship. It's that. Don't mean to erase y'all's names, but... Uh, they're written in heaven, though, right? That's right, if you're in Christ. But I want to talk to you about this issue of a son. When we talk about in Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ is the son of God. But a son, it's more than just a relationship, okay? You're, you're, you have a relationship with the Father, right? But you have an inheritance. And that's what we're going to talk about, too, Matthew. You mentioned it. It's also a position. And... The Son of God, it has to do with his position. His, um, he, has a, he has a role that he's going to play for the Father. He plays a role. And in this case, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to reign in his Father's kingdom, in his Father's, uh, in his father's throne, as it were. He's seated at the right hand. That's right, Christ himself. Now, notice here he says, and translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. God has given his kingdom both in heaven and earth, to the Lord Jesus Christ because of what he did at, at Calvary. Now, the Lord hasn't actualized that power yet. The Lord Jesus Christ, although he is the inheritor of both heaven and earth, all power was given to him by the Father. It hasn't been actualized. I, I like how Ryan says, you talk about a rain delay. I play baseball, and you play baseball in the Midwest, in Chicago like I did. You start the ball game, but then it starts the thunderstorm, so they stop the game and it's called a rain delay. They'll hold the game up an hour or two until the conditions get better. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ has a rain delay, R-E-I-G-N. He has, he has taken time to, 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 to do something between the time of his ascension to the right hand of the Father to the time when he's going to be coronated king of the heavens 
and then later kings on, on the earth, okay? He's going to have a kingdom in two spheres. Your Bible starts off in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And God has a plan for both the heaven and the earth. He began that plan with one new man named Adam. When God created Adam, he created Adam to rule over the earth. He told him to rule over the earth, have dominion and subdue it. But Adam fell, he sinned. Therefore, God had to have a, another new man, a new Adam, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, he's going to rule over the earth. And that's what the prophetic program is all about. From, from Genesis to the, to, the, to the book of Romans, you have God dealing with the earth, reconciling the earth to himself through his son, the Lord Jesus, in his kingdom. But part of what God is doing in Christ Jesus today is called the mystery. And why the Apostle Paul is important, um, my brother-in-law, King, you asked, you asked Matthew about Peter. And we're going to see that what Peter, what, what makes Peter important in the Bible, King, Peter has a, a purpose in the Bible. Peter's ministry the Apostle Peter, his ministry is to the nation of Israel. His focus is on this earth, the earthly kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, all this stuff is mentioned in the Old Testament in prophecy, uh, the things which God has spoken out of the mouth of all his holy prophets, the prophets of Israel. Peter is the head apostle for the kingdom program, the, the nation of Israel, the Jews. But God is not operating that program today. Peter is impor very important in Scripture, but Peter's ministry is not important for you and me today. When you rightly divide the word of truth, it is the Apostle Paul, the one that God raised up in Acts chapter 9. He is explaining what God is doing today. Paul wrote this book that we're looking at, the book of Colossians. Paul wrote 13 books, Romans through Philemon. Those books give us instruction on what God's doing today. Peter has a place in God's earthly program, but God has given us the heavenly kingdom. And that's the focus of, of God today. And the reason why we magnify Paul's office is because what is God doing today? He's not, he's not preaching that gospel of the kingdom that Peter preached. Peter went around talking to the Jews only. The Apostle Paul, he went out to us Gentiles, to the nations. The Gentiles, or the people of all the nations, that's what God is doing today. In this passage, you're going to see all of that. So I want us to look at that again. In Colossians chapter 1, look with me at verse number 13. Paul says about God the Father, who hath delivered us, he's our deliverer. He delivered us from the power of darkness. Satan is the God of this world, little g. He runs the course of this world. One day, the Lord Jesus Christ will reclaim his rightful ownership and rulership of this earth. But Satan is not just the ruler of this world. He has spiritual wickedness in heavenly places in Christ, in, in, in heavenly places as well. Notice here in verse number 14, that the, the, the Bible says in Job, Ryan just mentioned, the heavens are unclean in his sight. He charges his angels with folly. There are angels who have sinned against God. Okay. Hey, there you go. How you doing, little Gio? We're in a park. You got to play ball in the park, right? But in verse 14, Paul says, in whom, speaking of Christ, see, in Christ Jesus. By the way, when you see Paul put him, put the name Christ before Jesus, we know him as the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And that's fine. That's his, that's his due. I caught it. But when Paul puts Christ before Jesus, the focus there is what happened at Calvary, his suffering. When the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, he suffered for us. He suffered for our sins, okay? God placed our sins upon the soul of his own son. He made his soul an offering for sin. So when Paul puts that Christ first, he's focused on his suffering, and the song that Larry was singing, and the glory that will be revealed, okay? Larry was singing two songs about the glory, and Jesus Christ, our Lord, he earned that glory because he did something for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. He could die for us because he was pure and holy. He was the only one to, to live a pure, holy life, in sinless life in this world. And that's why God has given him 
the reigns of both the heavenly kingdom and the earthly kingdom. Go back, to, uh, if you will, to Colossians chapter number one. The wind's blowing me here. And that's why it says in verse 14, because of what Christ did, in whom we have that word redemption. We're redeemed by his blood. That song redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Redemption, he, he bought us out of that slave pit. He redeemed us. In the Old Testament, you could redeem uh, uh, someone. You would pay the cost if they were in debt or if they, were, they, they owed someone, you could redeem them out of that and pay their debt as a kinsman redeemer and so forth. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ did that. He says, in whom we have redemption. But notice what the currency was. He didn't have to pay with gold or silver. He paid with his blood. Blood is spiritual currency. In Acts chapter 20, it says, the church which he had purchased with his own blood, speaking of the, the church of God. Blood is spiritual currency, and it, it, it was only the blood. Leviticus 17, 11, God told the nation of Israel and their priests, the Levites, he says, I have given you the blood before it is the blood that make atonement for the soul. And the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it you, right? God has said that he needs pure blood to redeem man. And he, there was only one person who could do that, and that was the Lord Jesus, the perfect Son of God. And notice what he did for us, verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the what? Forgiveness of sins. We were just talking with Brother Armando from North Carolina, and, and, and he was reading the Spanish. And they, they, I believe you were saying, Armando, that it went from forgiveness to uh, remission, right? But see, the interesting thing about remission like like a terminal like a like a disease like cancer for example it can go into remission but then it can come back the issue with forgiveness it's it's full it's finished it is finished like the lord says it's done and when he says forgiveness in whom we have redemption through his blood even or that is the forgiveness of sins over in ephesians it says according to the riches of his grace god's grace is given to us through the cross of Calvary. And what the Lord did, he brought forgiveness. Um, who was asking me about remission? Go over to Romans chapter three. It might've been Armando earlier. Go over to Romans chapter three. Someone asked me about the remission of sins for the sins that are past and so forth. And what that is, Paul in Romans chapter number three, if you will, Paul is explaining how God dealt with man before the cross. How did God deal with men's sins before the Lord Jesus Christ was even born, let alone died? The Lord Jesus came 4,000 years after Adam. How did God deal with men's sins? Yes, through blood sacrifice of bulls and goats and animals, right? But was that sufficient to take away man's sins? No. Hebrews says no. Well, what did God do? Well, because of his long suffering, he forbeared men's sins. He remitted them on a short account basis. Look with me, if you will, in Romans chapter number three, the reason why God doesn't need the law to justify a man today is because Jesus Christ did something. Look at Romans chapter three, verse 20. Paul says, therefore, because now the whole world, the Gentiles were guilty, the Jews became guilty before God, and now all the world became guilty before God. Verse 19, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, that's that law of Moses he gave Israel, there shall no flesh, Jewish flesh, Gentile, circumcision, uncircumcision, no flesh, be justified in God's sight, in his sight. Then why give the law? For by the law is the knowledge of what? Sin. In our church during the Q&As, we'll talk about what's a sin and what's not a sin. And unless the Bible says it's a sin, it's not a sin. After these studies, I went back over the course of the last couple of weeks and read through the law because God would specify to Israel exactly what a sin was. He said, don't do this thing like the heathen do. You can do this thing. And he would give them his righteousness by that law. But now we don't need God's law in order to be justified and declared righteous. The law gives us a knowledge of what's sin, but notice how we get righteousness. It's not by a short account system of performance. Today, under God's grace, because of what Christ did, notice how you get right with God. 
verse 21. Romans 3, 21. But now the righteousness of God, his righteousness, notice, without the law. God has a righteousness that's apart from the law of Moses. Well, you say, how can that be? If you tell the Jew that, or if you tell uh, even these so-called Messianic Jews, they would freak out because, or any religious person, because you're saying, wait a minute, you need the law to be righteous. Well, no, you don't, because there's someone in whom we have redemption through his blood. It's a person now. Notice in verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is what? Manifested. In other words, it was hidden before. You didn't, God didn't make this known. And through the apostle Paul and his epistles, God is making manifest this knowledge. And what's that? Without the law is manifested. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, it pointed to whatever this righteousness of God is. And what is it? Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God. Now, the King James is the only one that's going to say it this right, the right way. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of who? Jesus Christ. It's his faithfulness. He's perfect. And because of his perfection, God is able through his shed blood to redeem us. Notice he says, the faith of Jesus Christ, and now through Paul, unto who? All. And upon all them that what? Believe. When you place your faith and trust in Christ, God will now impute his righteousness to you by faith, by his grace. Now notice, for there is no difference, speaking of Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and come short of what? The glory of God, his, 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 his perfect righteousness and goodness. Notice in verse number 24, being justified, what's that next word? Freely. Listen, under grace, God gives it to you free. If you had to do something for it, any works, it wouldn't be free. It wouldn't be a gift. So today, when you say in your heart, I believe Jesus Christ is my Savior. He's the reason why I'm right with God. God imputes that faith to your account. And notice he says, verse number 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is what? What's our study? In Christ Jesus. God has offered salvation full and free in Christ Jesus. And so to be right with God, you have to get in Christ. Well, now you say, well, Brother Ron, how do you get in Christ? You can't just step into him, right? No, it's a spiritual thing. That's right. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. That's a spiritual baptism. It's not water. When you place your faith in Christ, the spirit of God baptizes you or places you, identifies you in Christ. And that's your position. Positionally, you're in Christ by faith. That's your first faith, okay? The moment you place your faith in him and what he did at Calvary, God justified you. Notice in verse 24, being justified freely by his grace. By the way, because it's free doesn't mean it's cheap. He paid for it with his blood. He paid it. He paid for it. Notice being justified. It's interesting preaching with children screaming in the background. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, here was the question earlier about the remission of sins that are past. Watch this. Verse 25. Whom God had set forth. God has given the world through the apostle Paul, Jesus Christ. He tells the world, here's my son. He set him forth. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. He's that fully satisfying payment. There's nothing you need to do besides trust him for God to accept you. Well, Brother Ron, I got to go to church, don't I? Not to go to heaven. Should you attend NorCal Grace to be edified? Yes, because there is another part of your salvation. There's the judgment seat of Christ where he does look at your life and say, did you waste your life or did you serve me with your life? That matters to God. But when it comes to your salvation and getting to heaven, it's not based upon any works that you do. He is the fully satisfying payment. It'll be like you owe a million dollars to God. Christ wrote the check and you're still coming up with your penny saying, here, God, hey, man, I, let me let me let me let me throw a penny in there. 
God said, keep your penny. I don't need your penny. I got it all in my son. Now, if you want to pay him back, you could live your life in thanksgiving, but that's your sanctification, your service. That has nothing to do with your salvation. To be in Christ, you need to trust him and him alone. So this issue of a fully satisfying payment. Now notice in verse 25 again, through faith in his blood. Notice that when God speaks about salvation in Christ, he constantly brings in the blood of Christ, right? We saw in, in, in uh, Colossians 1, he says, we have redemption through his blood. Here, notice verse 25, through faith in his blood. God himself trusts the blood of Christ. The power is in his blood. Now notice here in verse 25, to declare his righteousness. Is God always right? Is he, does he always do the right thing? Yes. Well, was God righteous to deal with sinful man in time past before Christ came? Because now God deals with us because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, did on the cross. But what about the people who lived before Jesus Christ even was born? The Lord, was li the Lord lived 4,000 years after Adam. So why did God deal with Adam and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the 12, uh, the tw the 12 sons of, of Israel, the 12 tribes, Moses, and, and the people of Israel in the days of the judges and the kings? How did he deal with all those people? Well, this verse says that he was righteous, verse number 25, to declare his righteousness for the remission. Now, there's a difference. Oh, Fernando, you're so good. This issue of remission, that's different than forgiveness. Just like I said, if you have some type of awful disease, it could go into remission. But it could also come back, re, to, to, to come again. Remission has to do with, it'll, he could take it away temporarily because the Lord told the apostles in the Gospel of John, whomsoever sins ye remit, they are remitted. Whomsoever sins you retain, they are retained. Peter had the ability to say, your sins are forgiven you in Christ to those Jews. But then he could say, nope. Your heart's not right, like he says to Simon, and he put it, put it back on him. That's remission. It can come back. But what God does for us in Christ, he gives us forgiveness. He erases the penalty altogether because it's paid for. Notice, he remitted those sins that are past, and it was through his forbearance. God forbeared them. He knew that one day his son would die on the cross for those people and that he could use the blood of bulls and goats temporarily until the true lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, came. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came and he died on Calvary's cross, God, through the Apostle Paul, we now know that no longer is remission. He can now, because that price was paid in full, he can forgive you all your sins. And that's what he's saying in the time past, notice, through the forbear verse 26, Romans 3, 26. Now, you would not know, uh, um, my brother-in-law King asked Matthew about Peter. Peter didn't know anything about this. Peter understood remission of sins. In Acts chapter two, verse 38, Peter tells the nation of Israel, ye men of Israel, and he, he went to speak to them at, at, at Pentecost. And he says, repent and be and be baptized, We're talking about water baptized, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Peter didn't know anything about that. It wasn't time. Paul hadn't showed up. Paul taught Peter this information. Paul's apostleship trumps Peter's apostleship today. Once the dispensation of grace ends, then Peter's ministry will be back in effect but today, under God's grace, that's why you have to rightly divide the word of truth. The remission of sins is what the kingdom saints learned about. We receive, as members of the body of Christ, we receive forgiveness. Now notice, 
You only know this through Paul, verse 26, to declare, I say, when Paul says, I say, this is unique to him. Verse 26, to declare, I say, now what time? At this time in the dispensation of grace, his righteousness. God was righteous and he now declares that righteousness through the apostle Paul with the preaching of the cross of Christ. That he might be just. See, a righteous God must punish sin. He has to, to be right. Even though he's merciful, he's still just and right. So his holiness is offended. He has to pour out his wrath. He, he held off his wrath. He allowed his son to feel the full wrath of God on his own soul on the cross. God poured his wrath out on his own son so that we might not have to experience his wrath. And God has given to us full and free that salvation through his, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in who? Jesus. And when he calls him Jesus, that's his humanity. He lived. He experienced the pains. He experienced, at least, at least in, in, his, in, his, in, his, uh, in, his, in his mind, of, of being rejected, being misunderstood as Israel's Messiah, who, who they rejected him. He, he felt the pains of the whips of the Romans, of the nails, of the, of the uh, they pulled his beard out. He, he experienced everything we did, rejection, shame. They put him on that cross. Well, he dealt, he dealt with all that for us. Notice, he's the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. He took our sins upon his own humanity and he died for us. Now go back to our passage in Colossians. That's, what, that's where that glory is. It's in Christ Jesus. Go back to Colossians chapter 1. And so when he says, verse 14, in whom we have redemption, we need to get that young girl singing. She got a loud voice. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even, not the remission, the forgiveness of sins. They're gone. And who is this one who did this? He is the very God himself. If you want to see God himself, you see him through the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice in verse 5, 15, Colossians 1, 15, who is the image that's that outward manifestation. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. That's a position there. He is the one where it's going to explain. Verse 16, for by him were all things, what? Created. All things were created by him. Where? That are in heaven and that are in the earth. The things we can see here on earth, visible. What about the other things out there we can't see? They're invisible to us, but they're real. Visible and invisible. Now notice he's going to talk about these positions of authority and so forth. Whether they be what? Thrones. He has a kingdom. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Uh, make sure she doesn't swing that back, London. Because little Geo is right behind her. We got to get that back. Yeah. Come here. I don't, I don't want the little ones because they, they just yeah, walk yeah, into stuff. Swing it near your brother, he yeah. Her. Your brother. yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. We want everybody safe, right? That's right. All right. In, in, in verse 16, he talks about thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created for, by him and for him. God made this whole uh, uh, kingdom by his son for his son. Verse 17, and he is before, or he's, he's, he's first in rank. He is before all things, and by, all, by him all things consist. He holds everything together in God's kingdom, okay? In verse number 18, he says, now this, this, this has to do with you and I here. And he is the head of the body. We call ourselves the body of Christ because that's how God refers to us. Jesus Christ is the head. We, those, those of us who trust him, are his body, the body of Christ. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body. That's the church for today, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. The Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and we will likewise in the resurrection. The firstborn from the dead, but why was he the first? 
that in all things he might have the what? Preeminence. He is the one who is at the forefront. He is in charge of all of God's kingdom. He's the preeminent. Now, why, why did God do that? We're verse 19. For it pleased the Father. The Lord Jesus Christ, he serves at the pleasure of the Father. He serves to please the Father. Well, that's why it pleased the Father that in him, in Christ Jesus, should all fullness dwell. Everything that God is doing is found in Christ Jesus. Now, what about us Gentiles? Verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, there's that blood again. Everything that God does is through the powerful currency of the blood of Jesus. The blood of his cross, see, he suffered on the Calvary. Christ Jesus, he suffered on that cross, and now he's going to receive that glory that Larry spoke, sang about. Notice verse number 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. God is going to get back to heaven and the earth to himself by Jesus Christ, okay? By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Now look, look at us Gentiles, how we play a part. And you that were sometime alienated. We were aliens from God's thinking about things. And enemies. We were out and out enemies of God. We were, we were foes in, in our minds. And our minds led to what? By wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled, he brought back. He, 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 he changed the status. He made the relationship uh, available again. But why did he do it? Look at verse 22. In the body of his flesh through death. That's why when Paul says, him that believeth in Jesus, that was his humanity. He suffered on that cross in his body, in the body of his flesh through death. But why did he do it? To present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And that has to do not just with your position before God. Positionally, you're holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight but because you're in Christ. But God has something else. He has a practice for you. He, he has your practice in mind, too. How do you live your life? That has to do with your reward. Okay? And, and God wants us to, Philippians chapter 3, if you, if you go to our church, we have that sign that Ryan uh, made up for me. Philippians 3, Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That was Paul saying that. I was saying earlier, he didn't say we press toward the mark because you have to choose to do this. That's a choice. God presses us toward the mark. Yes. Paul chose, and he's our pattern, and we're to say like the apostle, I press toward the mark. But you have to do it his way. He's the pattern. And what is that? Notice here he says, verse 21. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 22. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and, and, and unreprovable in his sight, now watch the condition here. This is our practice. If you continue, that word if, it's a condition. If you continue, this is something you have to do. In the faith, and the faith has to do with that mystery doctrine given to the apostles. It's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now it's made manifest. It's the doctrine of the apostle Paul. The books of Romans through Philemon in your Bible are your, the information God wants you to know and understand and walk in. It's called the grace message. If you continue in it, grounded, you plant it, and settled, unmovable. Well, he puts it right there. And be not moved away from the what? What's the hope of the gospel? It is that opportunity to be a joint heir with Christ, Joint heir, did I spell heir right? Yeah, H-E-I-R, I always get them. Joint heir with Christ, and what that means? That means to reign with him. In 2 Timothy 2, Paul says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. Not our salvation, reigning with him as joint heirs. Notice what he says. Don't be moved away from the hope of the gospel. See, if you don't have this hope of the gospel, this reigning with Christ in mind, 
this pressing toward the prize, the mark of the prize, you're not going to be able to fully serve the Lord because your motivation will be, be uh, uh, limited. You won't have much motivation. Uh, I think we were talking with the brother earlier about he was saying there were some members of the body who, if, if you just looked at their, their life, you couldn't tell them any difference between them and those in the world. And Ryan mentioned, you know, because they don't understand the judgment seat of Christ. They don't, they don't understand the motivation that this life does matter for, for the Lord, how we, how we live. And if you be not moved away, and it's not the negative God wants you to focus on, being smashed at the judgment seat or something. He wants you to look at the positive, the reward. He talks about the hope of the gospel. That at that resurrection, when we go to the judgment seat, we receive that glory. Uh, go over to Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse um, 23 to 25. Colossians chapter 3, look at verse 23. Paul says, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily. Over in Ephesians, he says, with all your heart. He says, as to the Lord. Now, when he, when he calls him Lord, there are different names he uses. He'll use Christ. He'll use Jesus. He'll use Christ Jesus. But when he calls him Lord, what does that term mean, Lord? The righteous judge. And he says, when you're serving, when you're doing things, do it looking at the judgment seat of Christ. Do it as to the Lord and not unto men. Men will let you down. If your motivation is just serving men, they're going to let you down. They're going to anger you, frustrate you, and all the other things. But if your focus is on the Lord, he never lets us down. He never, he, he never, it, it, he does the right thing all the time. God is good. And your focus ought to be on the Lord Jesus, what he did at Calvary. Now watch this. Now what happens if you serve the Lord in that manner? Verse number 24. You remember that hope of the gospel? Here it is. Knowing that of the Lord, ye what? Shall. This is future. This is not your salvation. This is something that if you serve him, you will get. What's that? Knowing that of the Lord, ye shall receive the what? Reward of the inheritance. See, that's why if you don't understand the difference between what it, being an heir of God and joining with Christ, you won't get this. The reward of the inheritance, you already have an inheritance. You have the heavenly places. You have everlasting life as a free gift. Those were given to you the moment you trust Christ. This is something more than just that. This is something the Lord gives you there at the judgment seat. That has to do with reigning with Christ. Paul calls it a crown of righteousness. Okay. Hold your hand there and go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. What does it mean? Start, stop at chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 2, and then we'll look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. This reward of the inheritance has to do with something you earn and is given to you by the Lord Jesus himself. What is that? 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 12. 2 Timothy 2, 12. If we suffer, we shall also what? reign with him. If we deny him, what will he do? He will deny us. Now, when is he, when, when will he deny you? At the judgment seat of Christ. So obviously, if you're at the judgment seat of Christ, you're saved. You can't lose your salvation. The folks he's denying are there in front of him at the judgment seat in the heavens, in the air. They're saved. They haven't lost their salvation. I want, I want people to get this. The folks he's denying are right there at the judgment seat. He's not going to plunge them down to the earth. He's not going to banish them to the earth. They're saved. He will deny them reigning with him. If we deny him, he also would deny us. And so that you won't miss it in verse 13, Paul makes it clear. If we believe not. So it has to do with something of faith, right? It has to do with believing the doctrine. If we believe not, yet he abideth what? Faithful. He cannot deny himself. Do you know we're members of his body, of his bone and his flesh? Now go over to 2 Timothy 4. Look what Paul says here. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered. He's going to die. Well, and the time of my departure is at hand. Uh, we flew down to Southern California last week to be with the Martins family. And uh, 
I'm always fascinated with that takeoff because Paul talks about death for the, for the, for the saint as a departure. He says, in, 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 in Philippians, he says, to depart and to be with Christ is far better. He's talking about death. And every time that plane takes off, it's just like that. It starts on that runway really fast. I mean, they get up a couple hundred miles an hour and then do and, and I always think about that as I go on a flight. I think that's, that's what it's like. He says the time of my departure is at hand. Interesting, they warn you. They say, we're departing at this time. And they start getting on the thing, letting you know we're about to board and depart. Well, notice what he says, verse 7. I have fought a good fight. It's a fight, guys. You know it. I have finished my course. You got a course to finish. He's our pattern. I have kept the faith. He did not allow that doctrine committed to him to fall. It says about Samuel, he didn't let any of the Lord's. I love that. It says about little Samuel, he didn't let any of the Lord's words fall to the ground. That's what it says about him. When God gave him something, he, he held on to it, didn't let it fall. He, he appreciated, he valued God's word. I love that. He didn't allow any of God's word to fall to the ground. Well, Paul didn't either. Now, what happens when you finish a course? You keep that faith. Henceforth, verse 8, there is laid up. Well, who's laying this up? The Lord is. There is laid up for me. Now, if everybody's a joint heir, why wouldn't the apostle Paul says there is laid up for us a crown of righteousness? He doesn't. He goes, y'all can do what you want to do. It's laid up for me. But he wants us. But, but in the verse, he's going to say, now, I know this for me. Make sure it's for you. Watch this. Verse 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown. Who wears a crown? Royalty. Some, some, who, someone who's, in, who's reigning, who's in charge, who, who's going to make policy in the kingdom. Listen, he mentioned those thrones over there in Colossians 1. A crown of righteousness. Now, righteousness means breastplate of righteousness, breastplate of faith and love. Faith in the Lord Jesus, love to all his saints. There's a, the, the work of faith, labor, love. And then, Ryan, the patience of hope. That's being not moved away from the hope of the gospel, right? I'm, I'm patient, trusting God that as I suffer this, there's glory, right? As, as Larry's saying about, it. that's right, long suffering. Notice here, verse 8, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, and here's the definition, the what? The righteous judge shall give me. See, I, I got a question for those. Why Paul just making it about him there? Because he knows this is not true for every member. He's saying, I did my part, now you do your, what? He, 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 the, the, he shall give me at that day, the judgment seat. But, but now watch this, watch this. And not to me only, Paul cares about everybody else, but unto all them also that love is appearing. And that appearing was defined in chapter one as the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Now go back, if you will, as we come down to the end, go back to Colossians chapter number three, verse 24. So when you serve the Lord in the mystery, it says, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward, that's that reigning, of the inheritance, for ye serve the who? The Lord Christ. Now, why does he call him Lord Christ? Because he's saying it's in the, it has to do with the preaching of that cross. He suffered for and gave to the Apostle Paul, the Lord, righteous judge Christ. The suffering and the glory. Joint heirs with Christ, Romans 8, 17. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we might be, is right, be also glorified together. When he's coronated in, in the heavenlies, we will too, those of us who, suffered with him will we'll also reign with him now look what he says over here colossians chapter 3 verse 25 by the way romans 16 says that there were men who were in christ who served not our lord jesus christ but their own bellies will they get the reward of the inheritance if they serve not our lord jesus christ because it's 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 associated with serving the lord christ he specifically says romans 16 17 18 he goes they serve not our Lord Jesus, but their own bellies, carnal desires. And so, yeah, that's these guys in verse 25. Look at verse 25. But he that doeth wrong. Our study, Ryan, sins will be an issue at the judgment seat of Christ, not for your salvation, but he that doeth wrong. Some men's sins go before into judgment, 1 Timothy 6. Some men they follow after. Look what he says here at the judgment seat with the Lord. 
but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong. Now, how do you receive for the wrong? You suffer loss. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he have done. And God don't care who you are. There's no respect of persons. Go back to Colossians 1. So when he says, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, verse 23, that, that, that reigning with Christ, that crown of righteousness, have that in the back of your mind as you serve the Lord. Yes, there's terror of the Lord. Some men had to be motivated by that terror, but that's not how God wants us to be motivated. He wants us to this, have the motivation. Ryan, you mentioned the work of faith, the labor of love, the patience of hope. God always has a positive is there's the, the carrot and the stick. He puts the carrot there and say, serve me. Here's what I'll give you. Here we go. Which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. You know what Paul is saying there? He didn't go to every little. He's saying this message is known throughout the then Roman Empire. At Paul's death, that that Roman Empire was was filled with the knowledge of this mystery. Even a hundred years after the Apostle Paul, Timothy and his guys, the younger guys, they were so well known. They were known of those who follow Paul. They said, they said there are some Jews and some Gentiles who, who don't talk the way Jesus talked, talk the four gospels, the, the, the Jews. They were, they were associated with the Apostle Paul. And it, it was right around Ephesus. That was Timothy and his guys. They kept the message. Paul gave to Timothy, Timothy, he said, Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, he said, I want you to, he said, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. They did it. They did exactly what the apostle said in his dying words. All right, we're coming to an end. Notice what he says, which is preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Uh, I want to tell, see, Peter didn't get this message. I, Paul, was made a minister. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. In our second Corinthians study, we see in Paul rejoicing in his sufferings and afflictions because he knew what they meant. There was glory associated with it. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up, now this is unique to the apostle, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh. The same, the same uh, hatred that the Lord himself would receive the Apostle Paul was receiving that suffering and persecution for the, for the Lord. Listen, yes, he did, Dodie. In Acts chapter 9, verse 16, he told Ananias, I will show Saul how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. He suffered for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Fill up that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is your church. Paul suffered for us, too. He endured that stuff. Oh, we got to look at it. Stop. Go back to 2 Timothy. We're coming down in 2 Timothy 2. That's why he says this. Look at 2 Timothy 2, verse number 8 and 9 and 10. 2 Timothy 2, 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David, this is Israel's Messiah, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I, now, remember, for this gospel, Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer. He's, he's in prison, even unto bonds. But can you, can you stop the word of God? No. But the word of God is not bound. Do you know God is so wonderful? They could say, you can't even speak about Jesus Christ. You could still say it. How are they going to stop you? They got killed. You can still think about God's word. Get God's word in you. They could ban the Bible and we go underground. But if you get it in you, they can't stop me from knowing the verses. I could quote. Romans 3 right now in my head. Who's going to stop that? Nobody. They can't stop me from knowing God's word. If you get it in you. Exactly. God, God the spirit of God and the word of God work to, to, to build the, the, you're building Christ in you. He's the word, right? That's really what it means to build Christ. You're putting the word of God's grace in you, in your spirit, in your soul. You're in a man. Now, what did Paul do? He did nothing wrong. Verse, verse 9, 2 Timothy 2, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word, you can't bind the word of God, but the word of God is not bound. Verse 10, therefore, I endure all things for whose sake? For the elect's sake. That's the body. That they, that means us in the future, that they may also obtain 
the salvation. And I didn't even plan this. I'm going to tell you, the spirit of God. I didn't plan to go to this path. This is not in my notes. In fact, I, I haven't looked at any. I haven't done any of my, my verses in my notes. I just let it flow. But it's, it goes right to this in Christ Jesus. This was on my heart this morning. I said, what am I talking about? What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? And so. Not even having this, but notice it's right in verse 10 and it happened when we were over there in another passage. Verse 10. I didn't plan this. Therefore, I do all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation, which is where? In Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Larry started singing about glory. I didn't plan, that, this verse is not on there. I just, in Christ Jesus with what, Larry? Eternal glory. That's what you were singing about. In Christ Jesus. Where's that eternal glory? In Christ. Now, as we come down to the end, I wanna make sure that if you've never trusted Christ as your savior, you can get that glory right now. You can, you can have access to that glory. Being saved is glorious anyway, because whether you die or whether we're taken home in the resurrection rapture before death, we're gonna, it's, we're gonna go to glory. But there's more glory involved than just getting to heaven. Watch this. Verse number 24, Colossians 1. Let's end the passage there in, in, this, in this passage. Look at verse 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that is, which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh. Paul got beat down for the Lord, but he did it for us, for the body's sake, for the elect's sake, he says, which is the what? The church. Now, why does Peter have nothing to do with this church? Because Peter's church was those Jews doing the Lord's earthly ministry, the kingdom saints, all Jews. The, the little flock. This has to do with God's doing amongst us Gentiles. And who's the apostle to the Gentiles? The apostle Paul. That's why he says, verse 25, whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensing, the dispensation of God, which is given to me, Paul, for you Gentiles. That's what he's talking about. For me, to me, for you. And this mystery did what when it comes to God's word? To fulfill the word of God. It brought to fulfillment the word of God. We talked to Ryan. Was your cousin the Mormon? Which one was your cousin? Victor. Victor? And, and, and they talk about the Book of Mormon and all this. We said, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Because he goes, oh, I, I believe the King James Bible is God's word, but I also think the Book of Mormon. I said, wait a minute, though. Paul says that the information given to him fulfilled God's word. He says all scripture in 2 Timothy 3. We have it. That was before the Book of Mormon. That's something different. Paul says it's the mystery. Notice verse 25, where if I am made a minister according to the dis God dispenses, the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, well, you're a natural, aren't you? to fulfill the word of God. Oh, thank you. Oh, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> yeah. Verse 26, even the what? The mystery. Do you know that Paul's message is called the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation, the revealing of the mystery. And that mystery, it wasn't mysterious, it was just kept secret. Even the mystery which had been, oh, here's the word, hid. It was kept secret, it was hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ, Ephesians 3. Even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations. That means nobody before the apostle Paul knew this information. It's not in the Old Testament and it's not in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. This information didn't even come to the forefront until Acts 9. And, and God took Paul, I believe, to, to Mount Sinai in Arabia, Galatians, and the same place that God gave the law of Moses to Moses, he gave the grace of Christ to the Apostle Paul. And he gave him the salvation prescriptions that it is through the blood of Jesus people are saved. Go out and preach that, Paul. He got visions and revelations we saw over the course of years and years. But the main thing he got in those 40 days, I believe, is that you preach that cross. I'm going to take a little liberty. The rich young ruler, rich young Pharisee, look, ruler in Israel. He comes to the Lord Jesus. He says, good master, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, keep the commandments. He says, I kept them from my youth up. And Jesus, beholding him, loved him and says, 
you lack one thing. Sell all that you have and give to the poor and take up your cross and follow me. And, and the guy, he wasn't ready. He went away for he had many riches. And Paul says, I, I profited in the Jews' religion. The young man named Saul, he was a Pharisee. Concerning the righteousness which is of the law, he was blameless. He kept them from his youth up. He said he did. What if that rich young ruler was Saul and at that time, Christ says, you take up that cross and follow me. You give away those riches. Paul, no, he was rich. He says in Galatians 2, the son of God who loved me and gave himself. Jesus beholding him, loved him. I think that that rich young ruler could have been Saul and that when he says stop kicking against the pricks, he says, you know it, Saul. You know the word is burning. Stop kicking against the pricks. He says, who art thou, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus. And that's all it took. It could have been him. It would have been apropos because he says, who loved me. I love it. it says Jesus beholding him, loved him. Saul was that close. Just th those riches kept him from getting into the kingdom then. But maybe God says, I still, I still like his zeal and his heart. And, 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 and he's not getting into this, but I got something for him. What if that rich young ruler who he says, you stop kicking against the pricks and trust me. And he says, what would you have me to do, Lord? What if that was him? Well, notice the Apostle Paul, as we come down in, uh, what do I have you, Colossians? We still in Colossians? The wind's blowing. Yeah. You know what? When he says this, even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now, I'm talking about the dispensation of grace, is made manifest, that word manifest again, to his who? Saints. And what does he want us to know if you're a saint? To whom God would, here's his will, make known what is the what? The richest, see, Larry was singing about it. The richest of the glory of this what? Mystery among who? Us Gentiles. It's a Gentile, myth, which is Christ in you. Speaking of the Gentile, the, the, in the Gentiles, that's something that God did not put in the Old Testament. He says, the Gentiles will be blessed through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the 12 tribes of Israel. Through you and your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Israel will be the head, and the nations will be the tail. But through the fall of Israel, salvation come to us Gentiles. And that's what he's saying, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And what is that? Verse 28, whom we preach. We preach a person. We don't preach a religion. If you're looking for a religion, nor Cal Grace ain't for you. If you're looking for a philosophy in life, it's not for you. If you're looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to be preached, this is the place. Whom we preach, warning every man. Why do you give a warning to someone? There's, there's danger, right? There's danger ahead. Warning, warning. Well, warning every man and teaching every man. You need to be taught this information. Every man and women too. Y'all need to know the word of God too. But especially us men who God put spiritual charge of the body, we need to know this information. That's why we exist as an assembly. Warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. We teach all of God's word rightly divided. Every Sunday we'll teach Paul. The next Sunday we'll teach the Old Testament or the prophetic program. We go back and forth because God wants us to know all his manifold wisdom. And then when you do that, that we may present every man perfect where? In Christ Jesus. Every man perfect. Spiritual, spiritual maturity in Christ. And we'll end in verse 29. I pray that especially us brothers and sisters too. Listen. Paul says in Philippians, he says, you help those women which labored with me in the gospel, Philippians 4. So sisters, you guys are our help, our compliment, our support. And Paul says we need to labor. Everybody in Christ needs to labor, the men and women. The women have their part, the men have their part. Paul says they, these women labored with me in the gospel. And labor, what you say, Matthew, about that labor? It's that hard striving, right? striving according, but it's not your own flesh. Who's working? His working. The Spirit of God and the Word of God through your faith working to, to, to uh, provide the energy. 
Verse 29, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me, how? Mightily. That's more than just power. That power is the capacity. He put, it, he put it to use. It's mighty power. The, the ministry of grace is so mighty. You know what it does? It'll motivate people to move from one side of this country to the other just to be here. It'll motivate folks to get on a plane to visit us. Doug, LaShawn, Armando. Folks come. Craig, move here. Right, Craig? It motivates you to be a part of this. You flew all the way. You, no, you didn't fly. You drove. <laughs> That's a long drive, bro. Real deal. From, from New Jersey. They, they flew here. Marnie's here. Marnie, Marnie lives in Georgia. She flies here for, for work. She makes sure she drives a long way from Santa Rosa to be here. Hi, dear. Marnie, Sister Marnie, right behind you. Hey, I would, hey, 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 Richard. I was telling our, our new brother here, Mike from Hercules. I go, you ain't even come to, you don't even come for, for the furthest, you know. That's like five minutes away. You know. That's like five minutes away. You got it good, huh? We got people from New Jersey, uh, uh, Georgia, North Carolina, right here today. We got people from Modesto, Stockton, Galt, San Francisco, Oakland. I mean, Richard, when I first met you, you were living across the street from the church. Me and you are the closest. We've always been the closest. I told this boy, I said, you know, you're the, cl you the closest to this church, boy. You can be here. But anyway, but you know what? It's, it's, it's the grace ministry that will motivate you to, to, to sacrifice like that. It's a sacrifice. This brother is suffering. Our brother Ryan, y'all don't, don't even know. Over the eight plus years we've been together in, in this ministry, the things he has to go through. If, if this man doesn't get a video up, <laughs> if he don't get that video up that week, people say, is everything? Yeah, he's working. He's, he, got a, he got a job too. Amen. You know, he's laboring out there. He's working. Takes time. He gets, he gets a vacation, go, go over a few months sometimes or to, to, to Asia. But you know what? What, what keeps us doing this, it's because we, Ryan and I, and, and the brothers, we want to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus and motivate them that if they want to have an assembly to be a part of, NorCal Grace could be that assembly, you know? That's our, that's our main motivation is to get more laborers in this ministry. That's so that we can do more for the Lord. Uh, even the Lord says the laborers are few. We can only do so much, you know? So I would commend our ministry and uh, we thank God for Brother Ryan for his labor and uh, using his, his spare time and redeeming it for the Lord's sake by getting these videos up and going for, and, and, and edited and up on the, uh, YouTube. Uh, but we commend the ministry and we thank, we're thankful, uh, Brother Armando and Sister Stephanie, for your family coming all the way from North Carolina to visit us. We don't take that for granted. Marnie, you come all the way from Georgia. Um, we appreciate you guys coming to be a part of our, your souls are precious to us, okay? So we appreciate you all being a part. If you're out there and you never trusted the Lord Jesus as your savior, now's the time. In order to receive God's blessings of forgiveness, you have to be in Christ. How do you get in Christ? The moment you trust him as your savior, you say, I believe that you paid my sin debt, dear Lord. The spirit of God places you into Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. It's not a water baptism today. Peter had a water baptism. Paul has a Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. The Spirit of God places us into Christ, okay? And if you're saved today, I'd commend our ministry to you. Some of you are from afar. You could, you could pray for us. You could give to support the ministry so we can do more and live. It'll take the, the, um, the pressure off me and my family as a pastor because we still have to live to be here. You can help, and uh, we do appreciate that, okay? But we'll be here for you guys until the Lord come. All right, let's pray. Thank the Lord for his marvelous word. Heavenly Father, we do stop right now to give you thanks and praise for your holy word. Thank you for this beautiful uh, afternoon and evening that we can get out here uh, in your wonderful creation here on this earth and, and enjoy it with those of like precious faith. Father, we don't want to be ones who take this for granted. Uh, folks all around here, they take uh, this, this beautiful um, creation for granted. But you've blessed, you've blessed uh, man with, 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 your, with your manifold wisdom in your creation, we see the creator as we look in at your marvelous creation. Um, 
We were talking about Yosemite and the beauty there and the different things around that we can look at, as the Bible says in Romans 1, that these things show your glory and declare your, 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 your handiwork. So we do appreciate it. Even in this, even in this sin-cursed world, for Adam's sake, you still uh, display your beauty and your kindness and glory to us. So we saints in Christ, we, we await the, the, the day you send back your son for us. But in the meantime, may we redeem the time we have together as saints, get into your holy word, and fellowship one with another, which is just as important. We thank you, Father, for this beautiful day and this time in your word and the food that you provided through the saints. And uh, we thank you in the name of your precious son, the glorious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his wonderful name we pray. Amen.